Hi everyone, today I'm here with Dr. Ramachandran, a uh, spine orthopedic surgeon who's been practicing for a little over five years. Um, and he's been to, he studied at Harvard, Stanford, Princeton, and Yale, which I thought was really cool. So uh, thank you, Dr. Ramachandran, for being a part of this interview. Thanks for having me. And so uh, before we get into kind of like the details, maybe a little bit of your story, could you kind of briefly explain what orthopedic surgery is? Orthopedic surgery broadly is surgery that involves bone and soft tissue. Mm -hmm. um, so the subspecialties of orthopedic surgery include trauma work, so long bones, pelvis, things of that nature. And then some smaller things like hand surgery um, and my specialty, which is spine surgery. Mm -hmm. So you mentioned like hand surgery and spine surgery. Um, what are the most common special subspecialties of orthopedic surgery? And could you kind of give us a few cases of the, um, the most common cases of each of them? I would say in the community, most people do general orthopedics. So mm -hmm. even if you go through and get a hand surgery fellowship or a joint replacement fellowship, you do a little bit of everything. Mm -hmm. um, as in fracture work, some joint replacement and some smaller cases. For the other specialties, People that do sports fellowships usually do more arthroscopy, as in um, surgery involving arthroscopes and joints such as knees and shoulders. Mm -hmm. For spine surgeons such as myself, it depends very much on what kind of practice you have. But my most common cases are adult degenerative cases, so lumbar and cervical fusion and um, decompression. Mm -hmm. So could you walk us through a little bit of, uh, I'm not sure how much you want to share, of your story of why you chose orthopedic surgery and why you decided to go to all of these uh, kind of higher-end schools. Is it kind of a like a marketing thing or like a joke kind of because you're able to actually do all these things or? Had to go somewhere. <laughs> so that's just where I ended up. Mm -hmm. As far as orthopedics, uh, when I was a med student in Stanford, I had a very excited group of classmates who liked everything that they went through. Mm -hmm. And so whenever they were on primary care rotation, they all wanted to be primary care docs later mm -hmm. when they were doing rheumatology, they wanted to be rheumatologists. I hated everything mm -hmm. except for orthopedic surgery. Mm -hmm. So the choice was very easy. Okay. Um, I went through my orthopedic residency and spine surgery turned out to be the, uh, the thing that my hands liked, mm -hmm. as in the thing that felt most natural. Mm -hmm. Okay, so it was kind of like a process of elimination for you then? Yep. Okay. Kind of going back into orthopedic uh, surgery and the specifics of it. What's a typical day in your life like from when you come in to when you leave? And is that similar to other orthopedic surgeons? My days are pretty similar to other orthopedic surgeons. Um, I split my week up half the time in clinic, half the time in the operating room. Mm -hmm. When I'm in clinic, which is where we are right now, uh, I see patients in either 15 or 30 minute slots, depending on whether they're new or whether I've seen them before. Mm -hmm. We go through their imaging, we discuss potential conservative management such as physical therapy things mm -hmm. like that and if necessary we discuss surgery if we're going the surgical route we go through everything with models and images and discuss every last detail about what they're getting into have them go through a full consent and uh, and set them up for surgery on days that I'm doing uh, surgery I do them mainly at, uh, at Mercy Hospital nearby uh, I start there at 7 30 in the morning we usually do about two cases um, and it's the people who we've kind of prepped from here that meet me over there and we get them taken care of. And how is the orthopedic surgeon lifestyle different from that of other specialties? I think everything is what you make of it mm -hmm. and you, especially in private practice you can work as hard as you want to or as not hard as you want to. Mm -hmm. um, I take a lot of call which means that I'm frequently uh, here and available mm -hmm. and see patients in the emergency department and things like that. Mm -hmm. um, which can amount to a somewhat rough lifestyle at times, but mm -hmm. I have the flexibility and ability to take off as much time as I want to whenever I want to, which mm -hmm. is nice. I just don't make use of it too yeah. often. Mm -hmm. Okay, so what's the most challenging aspects of orthopedic surgery? A lot of the bigger spine surgeries that we have have very life-changing effects on people. Mm -hmm. As in, um, when things go great, people are thrilled, but with everything we do, there's the potential for really bad outcomes as well. Thankfully, I haven't had many of those at all, but uh, you have the ability to really help people or the ability to really hurt people, which mm -hmm. changes the stress level quite a bit. Mm -hmm. And so I was going to ask, what the, on the other hand, what the most rewarding aspect of orthopedic surgery is? is it, would that be the potential to help people like a great amount? or is it? 
you can take someone who's been living with chronic debilitating pain for years and very much change what they're able to do. Mm -hmm. That's a pretty gratifying and very visible thing. Mm -hmm. Okay. Are there any misconceptions about orthopedic surgery? Well, I don't know. What are the, uh, what are the, what are the opinions out there? Or, or are there misconceptions about the field, at least, for med students that want to maybe uh, consider that as opposed to other specialties? Well, I mean, you're supposed to be like six, seven, and pretty large. And yeah. Not, <laughs> you're pretty tall, though. So, mm -hmm. I don't know, maybe I'm, maybe I'm fighting the stereotype. Mm -hmm. Uh, are there certain personality types that do better in orthopedic surgery? I know the stereotype is like like that tall, like buff, like you know, like gym guy who um, is kind of more of like a bro. But uh, how's your experience like actually in the field? Uh, there are a lot of those, <laughs> <laughs> but there's a lot of everybody else too. Mm -hmm. Okay, would you say there are certain like like certain spe special qualities that you need? Like I'm sure being an orthopedic surgeon, you need good like hand-eye coordination or things like that, or not, is it not really a case? I can't be a total putz, but mm -hmm. I think most things can be trained. Mm -hmm. I uh, never considered myself an overly coordinated person, but mm -hmm. you can very much train yourself to be a great surgeon if you, uh, mm -hmm. if you spend years and years doing it. Mm -hmm. Okay, so a lot of it is maybe skill acquisition as opposed to like raw talent. Absolutely. So going to how to uh, maybe train as an orthopedic surgeon, what Tips would you give medical students to match into a competitive orthopedic surgery residency and a um, and residents to match into a competitive orthopedic surgeon uh, fellowship? As far as residency, uh, numbers were kind of paramount. Mm -hmm. So the right board score, and it's, of course doing a lot of research in orthopedics was always looked at very mm -hmm. favorably. Mm -hmm. um, as far as fellowships, uh, the process gets a little bit less competitive and more self-selecting. And mm -hmm. I think most people end up after finishing residency, getting into whichever subspecialty they're they're hoping for, mm -hmm. though it does take a little bit of geographic flexibility because you could mm -hmm. you can end up all over the place. Mm -hmm. Okay, and so obviously going to all these big schools and going to orthopedic surgery, you must have done very well in all your exams. What what was your kind of perspective on approaching studying, and maybe how did you study for exams like the step one or step two and things like that? Uh, just small panic attacks one by one. Mm -hmm. They uh, they were tough. They were really tough. I think, um, and they continue to get tougher. The ortho boards was the toughest one mm -hmm. that, uh, that we've taken so far. Actually, it's the last one I've taken, so I'm, so I'm good. But uh, I can't say I have any great piece of advice on how to get through those just because they are just so difficult. <laughs> how do you approach studying, though? Like, I'm sure there's a different kind of like mental framework besides having like natural intelligence where you approach maybe studying maybe more experimentally or I don't know like a certain framework than other people it's been long enough that I really actually have no idea yeah <laughs> <laughs> okay you mentioned that you do private practice are there a lot of opportunities for orthopedic surgeons to do things like uh, be a, an, a solo independent physician since I know a lot of physicians nowadays they move into like bigger groups or hospitals being employed uh, are there opportunities to do like private practice on your own or um, locum tenens other, other things? There are certainly a lot of people that do locums. Mm -hmm. um, the vast majority of orthopedic surgeons are part of the system, as in part of either bigger groups or part of medical groups, mm -hmm. uh, especially in this area. Um, solo practice was a good fit for me. Mm -hmm. Just personality-wise, it was something that, uh, that appealed to me, but mm -hmm. you unfortunately have to get very involved in the business aspect of medicine, mm -hmm. as in setting up your own insurance contracts. Mm -hmm. and, Figuring out your employees, mm -hmm. HR, payroll, all sorts of nonsense yeah. that none of us get any training in. Mm -hmm. But uh, I figure if you can make it through med school, then yeah. you probably can figure out the rest of it. Mm -hmm. And what tips would you give individuals who want to set up their own business? Since, like you mentioned, you don't get any of that training. Total trial and error. Mm -hmm. um, it's good to find a good business manager and have them do it, but mm -hmm. I didn't do that. I just you did it on your own. Did it all myself. Mm -hmm. So, I, uh, so I, I, I learned all of it eventually. <laughs> That's cool. I feel like most physicians in that interview nowadays are kind of like, you know, it's like very hard to do just in general and then like to do it on your own even just like can be increasingly difficult. True. But it gives you a flexibility that you, uh, you give up as soon as you mm -hmm. yeah. decide to be the employee of anybody else. Mm -hmm. That's true. Medicine in general and orthopedic surgery are progressing so fast that there are so many advances coming out. How do you stay on top of all the advances? Uh, read constantly and then continue medical education. 
Mm -hmm. There's enough of a requirement that you're almost forced to stay pretty up to date. Mm -hmm. So uh, besides reading up to date, uh, do you read uh, journal articles every day, or yeah. what do you? Well, not every day, but a lot. Mm -hmm. We all end up at conferences pretty frequently and things like that. Mm -hmm. How do you, or what, what do you do personally, and also how do you uh, avoid burnout, or what tips would you give us to avoid burnout? I mean, I think everybody just finds out what they like to do mm -hmm. and how it fits in this kind of busy lifestyle. Myself, uh, find my way to the gym as frequently as possible, and mm -hmm. love motorcycles. Yeah. Other than that, mm -hmm. work a lot. <laughs> yeah. Do you find that orthopedic surgery is kind of like um, something that like, you really enjoy deep down, that, that you work so much, or? Yep. Okay. Because I, I remember interviewing a, new, a neurosurgeon who kind of felt the same way where like, it wasn't exactly a hobby, but brain surgery was like what he like really just wanted to do all the time. So he didn't really take much like breaks or vacation or anything like that. And it seems like it might be somewhat similar to you. Or? Uh, not quite. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so you do take time off then for like writing or um, working out and things like that. Yeah. I'm not sure if you have like your own family with like kids and everything, but what tips would you give us for establishing a work-life balance? Still figuring that out myself. Okay. <laughs> it's a work in progress? Yep. Have you noticed any of your colleagues do certain things that is more conducive to having that balance? I think uh, the guys with kids usually are forced to have that balance. Mm -hmm. um, I don't have any, so yeah. I have a little more flexibility to mm -hmm. have no balance. It seems like people that are single usually work more and then... It seems like people, especially later on in their career, or physicians tend to cut back on hours. And I've heard actually a few doctors say that the best way to establish a work-life balance is to work like, like 0.8 FTE or something, uh, or 0.75 or something like that. Um, so it almost seems like for some doctors, they kind of think that it's not possible to establish a work-life balance if you're not cutting back on work hours. Do you feel like that's true? It's an interesting approach. It's a little bit tough, tough when you have your own practice because uh, mm -hmm. then everything is directly linked mm -hmm. as in the more you work the better things work out mm -hmm. um, so I would say I'm still still trying to figure that out mm -hmm. okay and on the topic of finances how well are orthopedic surgeons competent in general uh, or relative to other fields and um, what tips would you give to maximize that besides like you mentioned working more I don't know the, the recent numbers but in general orthopedic surgeons would be fairly compensated mm -hmm. Um, and of course, when you are fairly compensated, you end up working a little more mm -hmm. because it, you're being at least fairly rewarded for what you're doing, mm -hmm. uh, which of course ruins work life balance. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I remember reading about how, like, especially when you have your own practice, there's a certain baseline of hours that you need to work to kind of cover like overhead and like staff and all the, all those things. And then past that, there's kind of like almost like a like a multiplier effect where it, when you work maybe like. 12 hours versus like 10 hours a day, like that extra bit uh, contributes like directly to like income or net profits? I have fixed costs of about between 30 and 35,000 a month just to keep this place open oh, yeah. <laughs> and staffed. Yeah. So I have to at least bring in that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so that's, that's the tough thing about solo practice. If you take a long vacation, it's not that you didn't make anything, mm -hmm. it's that you're severely in the red. Mm -hmm. So you also have to make sure you're at least like meeting, meeting that baseline of yep, like supporting all of those structures in place. Uh, a lot of hungry mouths to feed out there. In this yeah. <laughs> so are there tips that you recommend for new physicians to manage their finances better? It's a good question. I don't really have a good answer for that. <laughs> I mean, all of us enter the workforce in very different situations. Some people start off as part of groups with a large income guarantee, and so things stay pretty comfortable the entire time. Other people a lot of debt to deal with, some don't. Mm -hmm. So I, I think it's very individual. Mm -hmm. And so how has medicine changed since you started practicing, which was, I guess, a couple of years ago, so... Um, not at all. Maybe not really, yeah. Uh, where do you see it going in the next few decades? I think that solo practitioners, such as myself, will slowly become a thing of the past, mm -hmm. and we'll get sucked up by big systems. Mm -hmm. But I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to hold strong as long as I can. Mm -hmm. Do you think it's possible maybe in like a few decades you'd probably be part of a, a group? Probably. Oh. Sure, anything's possible. <laughs> so you're open-minded to that. Would you choose the same career path if you could go back again? Or is there anything you'd change about it? Uh, yes, I would choose the same path. And what what do you feel contributes to that? It's been a good personality fit, and it's been rewarding in many ways. 
what tips would you give med students to find that kind of like that, especially that resonates with them so, as well as you did? Um, enter the process open-minded and don't decide before starting clinicals mm -hmm. uh, exactly what it is that you want to do mm -hmm. because um, you might be wrong. Okay, and so since you seem, it seems like you decided on orthopedic surgery kind of later on in the medical journey, uh, how were you able to get all those like um, research papers in before you applied? Once I kind of determined that that's what I wanted to do, I joined a lab and mm -hmm. all that. And uh, I did an extra year of research when I was in med school, Okay, which helped mm -hmm. uh, flesh things out a bit. Mm -hmm. So you took a year off. Um, and would you recommend that if someone decides like, oh, they want to do orthopedic surgery in their third year, take a year off, do research, and then apply? It can be helpful. And would these be uh, research like, uh, like hard science research, like doing a like collagen research or something, or is that would that be like things like um, case reports? I was involved in all of those, so mm -hmm. case reports, some prospective studies, and then some basic science work as well, mm -hmm. all in orthopedics. Mm -hmm. And how would you recommend med students pursue those things and find those opportunities? Start as soon as um, you kind of determine where you want to go. Mm -hmm. If it's a specialty that requires research, and a lot of them don't, mm -hmm. start meeting with the basic science labs and the clinical labs mm -hmm. early and see whether you can find a good fit. Mm -hmm. uh, last question, what tips would you give us to become good doctors? Enjoy it and don't get all pissed off about reimbursement and things like that because if you're all resentful about what you're doing, you're not going to do it well. Mm -hmm. um, you have to create a situation that you feel is fair, that you feel is productive, and mm -hmm. where you feel like you're able to do things in a way that you're happy taking care of people, mm -hmm. because that's when you're your own best. Otherwise, you get caught up in the, uh, the other stuff, the bureaucracy, the paperwork, the reimbursement, and that can all weigh you down quite a bit. Mm -hmm. And in the end, it affects your care. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's great advice. I'm, I actually just made a video about the Medscape 2018 uh, burnout and depression survey, and like at, at the top of the list for reasons of burnout was like uh, bureaucratic tasks and things like that. So definitely seems like a huge kind of like factor that weighs down a lot of physicians. Absolutely. Well, uh, thank you, Dr. Armstrong, for being a part of this interview. My pleasure. Uh, thank you guys for watching. If you have any questions, you could leave them down below in the description or in the comment section. I'll, I can ask Dr. Ramachandran and get back to you guys. Uh, thank you guys again for watching. Uh, let me know who you'd like me to interview next. And have a great rest of your day. Take care.